This is Carl Leopson, the University of Arizona. Least restrictive environment is one of the basic concepts in special education law. And you may have learned about it in another special education course or education course. But this course is about applying the law and least restrictive environment has a really strong influence on the process of applying special education law, and the, particularly on the process of placement or where a child receives their special education services or education services. So I want to take you on a quick walk through this concept of least restrictive environment and talk a little about how it applies to determining placements for kids in special education. So there are some other key terms that we're going to talk about in this session. Um, one of them is FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education. There's LRE, Least Restrictive Environment. Setting, which is the type of class or school. Um, resource Specialist Program and Special Day Class. So RSP and SDC are a couple of abbreviations that are used I think in the state of Georgia and we're going to adopt those just for this presentation because we're going to look at some of their materials. Um, accommodations and modifications are something that are important to understand. They're a critical piece also of the decision that's made when we're trying to determine the placement or where a student receives their education. Um, inclusion which I'll, may surprise you with the fact about the word inclusion as it relates to special education law and supports and, and we'll talk a little bit about supports for students in special education so that they can receive their education in the least restrictive environment. The quick, quick look back at LRE and it could be considered as a as a requirement of a free appropriate public education and it states in the law that students should be educated with non-disabled students to the maximum extent appropriate so what the notion is to find out the most appropriate place for a student to receive their education but it should be to the maximum extent with children who do not have disabilities. It should allow kids access to the general ed curriculum and in interaction with non-disabled students. Students should be placed in a separate class only if the disability is severe enough that an adequate education can't be obtained with supplementary aids and services in the gen ed setting. So this is really important and that's where the accommodations and modifications come in okay? that we can't just consider where a student should receive their education and then say well if they need additional help then they're gonna have to get that in another setting can't do that um, legally legally we are to consider ways to provide them with those supplementary aids and services to keep them in a general education setting to them a maximum extent appropriate with peers that don't have disabilities. So accommodations and modifications are something to consider. So, and there's a difference between the two and it's important that you understand the difference between the two. An accommodation means a change to environment instruction materials or activities that does not change or weaken the state standard. Okay, So if you had a standard that required a child to add single digit numbers, you might provide that child with assistive technology to help them do that. Um, you might provide them with 
appear to write down the problem for them. Or you might provide them a little extra time to figure out what the answer was. A modification, on the other hand, is a change to materials, assignments, or assessments that requires less than the state standard. Right. So if you provided a child with um, the requirement of adding two single digit numbers and gave them hints, that might be a modification. If you gave them additional um, instruction during the session, that would be a modification. If you changed it to only single digit numbers below five, that might change and be a modification instead of an accommodation. So instead of giving the more child more time, you're actually changing the problems or changing the requirement. Now if time is a requirement and you change it, that starts to become an issue and it becomes actually kind of a muddy issue. Inclusion, and I said I had something that you might not know about the term inclusion. Um, inclusion means having students with disabilities in the same activities as students without disabilities. That's across classrooms, PE, lunch, activities, field trips, everything. Some schools do full inclusion. Some districts do full inclusion, which means they have no separate special education classrooms. Everything is provided for students in general education settings. And the thing you might not know is that the term inclusion is not in IDEA. It grew later. Right? Um, and it's something that is a little controversial in the area of special education. There is no mandate for full inclusion. So states, districts, particularly, can make decisions about how they want to provide special education services for students. And some will not do inclusion, some will do full inclusion. The supports that we provide are traditionally provided in a, in a range called a continuum of supports. And from least restrictive to most restrictive, it's general education classroom, maybe some consultation with a special education teacher, but the child is still in the gen ed classroom. Some special education, more special education, a classroom assistant, collaboration, combinations, all the way up to what might be most restrictive which could be home instruction or a placement in a setting that is not even within the school or the district. Right. Let's take a look at what this might mean. So in general education, it might be that a student is just included in that classroom it's determined that that child should be in that classroom and can best receive their education in the classroom without any special education services. It could be that there's a classroom assistant or a paraprofessional who's coordinated through a special education teacher who has multiple kids on their caseload, all of whom are in general education classrooms but who just checks in on those kids, checks in with the paraprofessional, helps guide them in terms of what's happening regularly, helps guide the teacher, but that child gets minimum support. You could have a child in gen ed with minimal support with access to some resource class during the day. So it may be determined that for certain math objectives, it's best to, for a child to leave the gen ed classroom for a shorter period of time to be one-on-one -on -one either with a paraprofessional or with a special education teacher. 
when you when you start to reach a tipping point it could be that a child is in a special education classroom for more minutes per day than they are in a gen ed classroom okay so in which case it might be considered a situation where a child is in special education class placement with the addition of inclusion in general education. It could be that a child is in a special day class with very minimal general education interaction which might be activities instead of academics like lunch, recess, and PE. Um, in it's very few situations these days in which students are in a special day class with no general education interaction. That's that's nearly unheard of. So how is the determination made? First, there's no way to determine what the least restrictive environment will be for a disability category. In the old days, um, when I was teaching special education, um, there were situations in which a child would be identified with an emotional and behavioral disorder and the immediate reflex was, great, sign them up for the classroom we have with all the kids who have emotional and behavioral disorders. Or if a child had a learning disability, it was immediately, great, then they'll be in the resource room for kids with 30 disabilities. It's not done that way anymore. Um, it shouldn't have been done that way then, probably. But it's not done that way now. And LRE is determined on an individual basis. So we have to think about the individual needs of the student. Um, one way to do this is by looking at each individual IEP goal for the student and determining where it can best be taught. And then if a child, we determine that a child can't be taught that IEP goal in a gen ed classroom under the circumstances the way they are, what supplementary aids and services could we add to keep them in that gen ed classroom? And only past that point would we consider moving that child out to a separate setting. LRE should not be based on the disability category. It should not be based on district convenience. So just because a district has a specific classroom for a disability category, or just because a district has a certain type of teacher at another school doesn't mean they're allowed to take a child and shift them over to another school. Right? And cost cannot be the determining issue. Right? So a district cannot say, I'm sorry, but we don't have, just don't have money to provide your child with a, a medical assistant to give them their diabetes injections twice a day. They can't do that. Um, LRE should be based on individual need. The state of Georgia, I think, provides a nice decision-making model, and other states use something similar. So where we start with documenting the child's current level of performance, and we'll talk about that soon in this class, that's the mysterious PLAFT. Um, we create student goals and objectives in the IEP based on the student's current level of performance. Then we determine how those goals and objectives could be taught in each in the general education classroom and for those that can't be taught in gen ed with supplementary aids and services we determine in what setting they might best be taught and then lastly we determine what additional settings or activities might provide the student with opportunities to be with students without disabilities like uh, clubs and other activities so let's do a quick review. Decisions on placement are made by the IEP team. 
they're not made by a single individual on the IEP team. They're to be made by the team reviewing the information they have. Students with disabilities should be educated with non-disabled students to the maximum extent possible. That's the language within the law. One good way to do this is to consider how each objective can be met in the general education classroom using accommodations and modifications. For the remaining objectives, you should consider the setting in which those objectives can best be met and the child would only need to be in that setting during the time that they're working on meeting that objective. Now one thing we didn't necessarily cover was the need to consider personal and social issues. There isn't necessarily anything specific in the law in that regard, but people are going to come to the table with personal and social issues. Um, they're going to come to the table with ideas about where they think a child should be, which is why it's really a good idea to have a process like going objective by objective to walk through something that's fair and reasonable. And it's also good to acknowledge people's issues and let them know that you think they're important. So this is Carly Opson at the University of Arizona. Um, we've looked at the concept of least restrictive environment and how to apply it in placement of students with special education needs. Um, for the discussion, I'll ask you to look at a scenario and uh, answer a few questions about that scenario. Okay. See you again online.